So today uh, we want to talk about, or I want to talk about uh, uh, barrier method. Okay, and we are in uh, section 4.1 of the book. Okay, so it's chapter 3 is quite large, it has a lot of necessary conditions and sufficient conditions for optimality. But uh, we only covered KKD condition and John Fritz condition and we will skip over all other methods, all other uh, results uh, because they are not very useful for, uh, they are all special cases of this more general condition. Okay, so we have already done the most general condition and then others are just special cases for specific, uh, specific kind of optimization problems like linear programming or linear constraints and so on. So, the topic today is about barrier method. Uh, the setting is as follows. We want to minimize a function where x lies in some set capital X and I have another constraint gj of x is less than or equal to 0 for j equals 1 to r. Okay. So, to give you an example, suppose you want to minimize f of x such that ax is equal to b and x is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So, if you want to solve this problem using barrier method, you have to define this set x and you, do, you have to define this set of inequalities. So, the way I am going to transform it is I will minimize f of x for x in capital X such that minus x is less than or equal to 0 and I am going to define capital X as x in Rn such that Ax is equal to B. Okay. So, is this point clear? Remember in the KKT condition we had a set of, we had x in Rn, we had a set of equality constraint and we had a set of inequality constraints, right, for the KKT condition. But here, we write the inequality constraints explicitly and then all other constraints can be pushed inside this uh, set x, okay. So, so that is uh, that one way, that, that is one way of doing it. There is, there are other ways also of uh, doing the same thing. Let us say you want to minimize f of x such that 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to b. Okay, a box constraint. You can define the set capital X as x in Rn x greater than or equal to 0 and you can define the inequality constraint as x less than or equal to b. Okay, so you can define x in any fashion you want. Uh, but we'll 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 see why uh, why you can put some of the inequality constraints in the set X and some of the other inequality constraints should be written explicitly as constraints. So we'll see some uh, we'll see uh, we'll get to that reason pretty pretty soon. Okay, is this point clear? Okay, you can push some of the constraints in the set X. You can leave some of the inequality constraints outside explicitly and then you can write the problem in this format. Okay, and so let us see how we should go about solving it. So, so let us say we want to solve, I have a function that looks something like this. 
over a real line let's say interval 0 and 10 okay so i have to i have i want to minimize this function in this interval okay so x is But I have a problem. The problem is I can find an initial condition here, right? And if I allow the gradient descent method to go on, uh, we might go out of this, we might go on we might go on this side or we might go on that side depending upon how we run the de gradient descent. So I don't want that to happen. Okay? Let me Okay, I don't want that to happen. I don't want the gradient descent to go outside of this 10, uh, this uh, limit 10 or limit 0. Uh, what is a good way of dealing with that problem? We know that it will happen if we, uh, if we just apply the gradient descent usually without making any modification, right? So one option is you project it back onto the set. The other option is uh, you use, a, a, what was that? Manifold sub-optimization method. So you always stay at the boundary and so on. Uh, but what is another method that you can think of? Okay, from this name should ring a bell. What can we do to run uh, a, a gradient method within this set with a guarantee that we will never go out of the boundary? Barrier on both the sides. But how would you create a barrier? Sorry? Infinity? Okay. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no. You can't do it by picture. You have to do it with math. So how do you, how do you put a barrier so that your algorithm doesn't go out of, out of the boundary? Yes? Put a high penalty on the side. Okay, so I'm going to put some penalty. As soon as you get closer to this side, I'm going to put some penalty, right? And as soon as you get closer to this side, I'm going to put some penalty, right? That's a natural way to think about it. So what kind of penalty functions or barrier functions can we use? So there are two very common barrier functions. B of x, which is minus summation j equals 1 to r log of minus gj of x. So this is known as logarithmic barrier. And the other barrier function is B of x equals minus summation 1 over gj of x. This is known as inverse barrier function. Okay. And the idea is that we want xk, we want to generate xk by as minimizing f of x plus some parameter epsilon k b of x x is in capital x okay this is the key idea of course we would assume that epsilon k is greater than zero and it's a small positive number. And we'll take epsilon k going to zero, okay? We'll keep reducing the value of epsilon k and solve this minimization problem at every point of time. Okay, so we want epsilon k to go to zero.
so what is happening in the actual figure so these are my barriers and the way I'm going to transform the function is this way okay so as as gj of x goes to 0, this term blows up to infinity. As gj of x goes to 0, this term goes, blows up to infinity. Note that there is negative sign here. Okay? So, b of x is always positive because gj of x will be negative, right? That's what a feasible point will, will be where gj of x is negative. And since you are negative, as you go closer and closer to the boundary, you will start blowing up, right? and so you would want to go away from the boundary. This is very similar to the affine scaling method for linear programming where we were always trying to go away from the boundary. Do all of you remember that method, right? So we were always trying to go away from the boundary and in this case it's exactly, it has a very similar uh, idea in this particular situation as well. So you will always try to go away from the boundary and you will try to find a point xk which is minimum for a specific, so you pick a specific value of epsilon k and you solve this minimization problem, you get xk and then you reduce the value of epsilon k to a lower value and you again run the same minimization problem and slowly you will converge to the optimal point. So this would be for instance epsilon k equals to 1 and then you will have this will be epsilon k equals 0 0.5 and you will have a similar setup epsilon k equals 0 0.1 and so on okay so as you take epsilon k going to 0 the this function which you can call fk of x will converge to f of x as epsilon k goes to 0 and it so turns out that xk would also converge to x bar which is the optimal solution to the original problem. Okay. Any question about this? No. There is one problem with this convergence result. What's the problem? I mean, it's not a. I mean, I haven't proved it. But what's the problem with this particular uh, statement? Remember, the barrier function blows up at the boundary, right? So no matter what the value of what value of epsilon k you take. You will converge in the interior of the set, but at the boundary, this won't be true because this will always be infinity. Right? So you will get closer and closer to the boundary, but you will never actually touch the boundary, which was also the case in a fine scaling method, if you remember. Okay, you will get closer and closer to the boundary, but you will never touch the boundary. So that's what happens in the barrier method as well. So if you truncate the method, you are very close to the optimal solution, and if your optimal solution is at the boundary, you will never be able to reach that place, but you will you can be arbitrarily close to that optimal point. And for most of the applications, being close to the optimal point is good enough. Okay, you don't have to be actually at the optimal point. Now, I want to uh, exp I want to mention a few constraints that are needed on the set X as well as on these functions G J. Uh, so that this problem makes sense and it can converge to the optimal solution. So what are the con conditions? So we want to make this following assumption. Let's say S is the set of points in X such that dj of X is strictly 
negative for all j in 1 to r. So you want the assumptions are, you want S to be non-empty, okay. So in particular, if you have a condition that AX is less than equal to B and AX is greater than equal to B then that condition is ruled out because there is no point x that can both be ax strictly less than b and ax strictly greater than b okay so that condition is ruled out here this is not allowed and the second <laughs> assumption is if x is a, if x is feasible feasible point then there exists xk in S such that xk converges to x. So let me, so let's see in picture what's happening. So if x is a feasible point, so x is in set x and gj of x is less than equal to 0, then you can arrive at that point x by considering a sequence purely in this set s. Okay, so if you are, let's say you are looking at x greater than equal to 0, right? So what is your s? s is everything above it, not including these two lines. Okay, so if I pick a point, x which is feasible, I should be able to construct a sequence that is entirely in S. So this is x1, x2, x3, x4 and so on. It's entirely in S and it converges to x eventually as k goes to infinity. So if x is a feasible point, then there exists a sequence xk that is in S such that xk converges to x in the limit. Okay, so these two assumptions are required for the barrier method to work. When would this assumption be violated? Uh, let's see. Typically when you have isolated points in the set X, then these conditions are violated. So you could have, so if you have your set as this and a point and you look at S, S will be entirely inside, okay? And, and then if you take a sequence in S, you cannot reach this point, okay? So whenever you have isolated points, this condition, second condition might fail. So in some sense, what you want is, you want a set that has, whose interior is not an empty set, or you want a collection of sets whose interior is not an empty set, okay? So you can't have a bunch of points and you apply the barrier method over these bunch of points, okay? You want this, set to have some sort of interior, it shouldn't be empty. Is that, does that make sense? I mean, in essence, what you want for barrier method to work is to have an interior in the set, okay? So that you can, you can construct a barrier and then you can go through the set itself to the optimal point. And if you have, if you have isolated points, you may not be able to do, you may not be able to do it. Okay, because, uh, because you won't be able to arrive at that point, isolated point through this interior of the set that you started with. 
Okay, that's some mathematical mumbo jumbo, but kind of needed for this problem to work, for this method to work. Sorry? Well, you see, you could have, so that's a good point. I could have one set, so my set looks like this, okay? So I do have interior here, and I have interior here, and so I can, but you know, interior is somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat misleading uh, for the following reason. If you have a hyperplane in high dimension, then the interior is empty. Okay, so by definition, a if you have a hyperplane, so let's say you have a two-dimensional plane in three-dimensional space, by definition, the interior is empty. So, so saying that it should have an interior is not really right, but you understand that it should have some sort of open set inside it, right? So it's called relative interior. So that's what, uh, that's what actually S is called. So this set S is called interior of the set X. No, interior of the set relative to X. Okay, so it's called relative interior, you know, if you're familiar with that term. So S would be a relative interior of the set X. Okay. So the main result here is theorem is if XK converges to X bar, then X bar is the global minimum. Okay, and by the way, these assumptions are satisfied if JJ, GJ of X is a convex set. Sorry, is a convex function. If GJs are convex functions, then uh, two is satisfied. And for one to be satisfied, you have to, uh, uh, you have to try to see whether that, uh, uh, whether S is non-empty or not. Not very hard to check. Unless you have conditions of this sort, S will always be non-empty. But the second condition will automatically be satisfied if gj of x was a convex function. Okay, and the result is, if xk converges to some limit, then that limit must be the global minimum of the original function, global minimum of f. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention is if, uh, If GJ is convex for all J, then B is convex. Okay, so if you have a convex problem, GJs are all convex, then the barrier function itself will become convex. Okay. So the question is, how do we go about solving a problem? Let's 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 start with some problem, and then we'll see how can we how can we solve it. So, but any question so far on whatever we have done? No. Okay. So let's see how do we solve it. Okay, so the idea is I pick epsilon k, solve xk equals to argmin xn 
capital X or X in yeah capital X f of x plus epsilon k b of x so and then you pick epsilon k plus 1 0 0.5 epsilon k and then solve the same problem with the new updated epsilon k plus 1 So this 0 0.5 is quite arbitrary. You can take 0 0.1, you can take 0 0.9, you can take whatever uh, works for your problem. But this is the way to solve it. So initially start with some x0 and epsilon naught. Let's say epsilon naught was equal to 1. And then you, you had this function. You found the minimum. How would you find the minimum? How would you f get to this point? Well, this. Uh, in many cases, this would be a solving a nonlinear function plus a strongly convex function over a convex set. Okay? In many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, you will have a nonlinear function plus a strongly convex function over a convex set. So you can apply, if there are nonlinearities within x, within the function f, this barrier function will try to get rid of those nonlinearities because it blows up pretty quickly. Okay, it, it has a very strong convex nature, so it blows up pretty quickly. And so, so let's say your function was something like this, which is a nonlinear function. As soon as you add a barrier function to it, it would become something like this. Okay, and so. If you run a gradient descent algorithm or any conditional gradient method or any of those gradient methods that we have studied, Newton's method, if x, if x was Rn, right, you can run the Newton's method because then it becomes an unconstrained optimization problem. So you can run the Newton's method, you can get to this point, name it x1, right? Now change the value of epsilon k, and then you will see a small cusp appearing here, but x2 will be, for instance, somewhere here. Okay, So you can run the gradient descent. So you start with x1, run the gradient descent, you reach x2, then change the value of epsilon uh, again, make it uh, uh, 0 0.5 multiplied by epsilon 1 or epsilon 2, and then you will probably change the function like this. Okay, and then you arrive at x3 and you keep going on in this way. And eventually you will reach the you will reach the global minimum of this function. So that's the one of the benefits, one of the many benefits of barrier function. Not only the barrier function will not allow you to go out of the set, it will also smoothen the function a little bit, make it somewhat convex. So Finding a local, uh, finding a global minimum using Newton's method or using one of those uh, convex methods that we have studied uh, for nonlinear optimization, you can use any of those methods to get to the optimal solution and then pick a different value of epsilon and run the entire set of, uh, run the entire algorithm again. Okay, and we'll do it for linear programming in the next class, but I want to explain to you how it works in practice. Okay, any question on the working of this algorithm? Okay, this is also known as interior point method. And the affine scaling was one of those interior point methods. So let's solve a problem. Let's say we want to minimize half of x1 square plus x2 square such that x2 was greater than or equal to 0. No, x1 was greater than or equal to 2.
what would the barrier function be? What, what is the barrier function here? Log of x1 minus 2, okay? So this original function looked like this and I wanted to minimize this is my x1 equals to 2 so I wanted to minimize in this region okay now what does my function look like it looks like this is my x1 equal to 2 this is what fk of x looks like Okay, this is my original function, this is my f of x, this is my fk of x, okay? So this is the barrier that we have introduced and this is my function on this side, okay? So as you move away from this, uh, this boundary, the value of barrier goes smaller, grows smaller and smaller and then epsilon k makes it even further smaller, but closer to boundary, the barrier dominates and it makes it very close to infinity. So now this is a convex problem in this region. So I can take the first derivative, right, and I can set it equal to zero and that will give me the optimal solution for fk of x, so let's do that. So what is my gradient of fk of x, x1 plus epsilon k over x1 minus 2 and then x2 and this should be equal to 0. What does this imply? My what should my x2 be? x2 be equal to 0. What should my x1 be? So I need to find a value of x1 that satisfies x1 plus epsilon k over x1 minus 2 should be equal to 0. Okay, so what should my x1 be? Any thoughts? We have to, I mean we have to solve it, so x1 equals minus epsilon k over x1 minus 2. So that gives me x1 square minus 2x1 minus or plus epsilon k equals 0. So what should my x1 be? x1 will be 2 plus minus square root of 4 minus 4 epsilon k over 2. Okay, so that is what? 1 plus square root 1 minus epsilon k. Did I make a mistake somewhere?
sorry no x1 plus epsilon k over x1 minus 2 that should be equal to 0. So, I have x1 square minus 2x1 plus epsilon k this looks right. So, this would be my uh, you know but this is 1 plus something smaller than 1 that is not satisfying the constraint. Yeah. Yes. Is that right? Yes, it should be negative log. Okay, so it should be negative here. Negative epsilon k log of x1 minus 2. So there should be a negative sign here. So that will have, then I have a negative sign here. I have a positive sign here. Okay, that works out. So now my x1 is strictly greater than 2. Okay. And what happens if I take epsilon k going to 0? I converge to the optimal solution for this problem. Right? It is not very hard to see that the optimal solution is x1 equals to 2 and x2 equals to 0. Right? So that is what we arrive at if we take epsilon k goes to 0. this is the optimal solution. Any question so far? Okay. So now I want to do linear programming with the logarithmic barrier function. So the barrier function would look something like this. And the reason why it's important is because this method was devised in 1984 and it was at that point of time the fastest algorithm for solving linear program. I mean it's still the fastest algorithm for solving linear program but uh, it's fastest in the worst case, okay, not in general. In the worst case, uh, the barrier method or the interior point method with the logarithmic barrier function will be the fastest method for linear programming problems. So let's look at the method. What the idea is, so I want to minimize C transpose X such that AX equals to B x greater than or equal to 0. So I have to define what my x is. So what should I, what should I take my capital X to be? How do I define my capital X? that will be x in Rn such that Ax equal to B. So what would my function be? fk of x that will be c transpose x plus epsilon k no not plus minus epsilon k log of xi i equals 1 to n. Okay, so this is my cost function and my set S would be 
would be x in R n such that a x equals to b, x is strictly positive. So if you look at it in the three-dimensional plane, it would look something like Okay, so this plane that you are seeing that is my Ax equal to B, x greater than equal to 0, so that is this plane and then S is the plane without this boundary. Okay, so that is my set S, this plane without this boundary that you see. And so what is our goal? Our goal is to find a sequence, I mean what we will do is we will keep changing the value of epsilon k, we will shrink the value of epsilon k and we will find x1, then x2, then x3 and so on until we reach the optimal point of this uh, particular optimization problem. Okay. So, so there is this concept of central path here which is as follows, let us say this was our set okay, and this is my x epsilon. So x epsilon is defined as argument of or uh, ln xi negative i equals 1 to n. So that is the in some sense that is the centroid of this particular uh, region and this region is defined as uh, as ax equal to b x greater than equal to 0. So that, that looks like this region and so this is my x epsilon and as you as you uh, trace let us let me call x epsilon as did I call it S? Well, this is some x star. So that is the central point and x epsilon would be argument of x in S. C transpose x minus epsilon summation log of xi. Okay, so this is my x epsilon. As I change the value of uh, as I change the value of epsilon all the way from infinity to 0, what you will trace is a point, is a path that goes, so this is my x infinity and this will be my x 0, okay. But well, let me put a star here so you do not confuse it with the starting point. So this is epsilon equals infinity. So at epsilon equals infinity, this is my x star infinity, which is the same as same as this number, because what happens when epsilon is very, very large? This term, this term dominates this term, right? So you will you will stay very close to the center of this particular convex set, and as you reduce the value of epsilon, so you you trace a path, and this path is known as central path okay and so the goal in this particular uh, linear programming problem is to trace that central path to get to the optimal solution okay is this clear why why i'm calling it x infinity it's because C transpose X does not participate in this optimization problem if your value of epsilon k is very, very large. Okay, so that is 
x star infinity, and as I reduce the value of epsilon, I converge to a point at the boundary, which is where epsilon is equal to zero, and that would be the optimal point. And the goal in this method is to trace the central path. Okay. So what are we going to do? At every time I have to solve this problem, I have to minimize C transpose X minus epsilon summation of log Xi. Okay, so at every point of time I have to solve this problem such that Ax is equal to B. How should we solve this problem? Well, we can, we can apply Newton's method We can use Newton's method over this surface in order to get closer to the central path. If we solve it, we get x epsilon, right? We start with an arbitrary point within the set, and we use Newton's method, we converse to x epsilon, and then the goal is to reduce the value of epsilon and solve this problem again, but with x epsilon as the starting point, okay? and so. We might move out and then go back into the set again, into the central path again. So that will be x, uh, let's say this is x5 and this is x1. Okay, so with epsilon equals 5 and then with epsilon equals to 1. But the key insight here is even though we would like to stay on the central path, it doesn't matter if we are on the central path or if we are close to the central path. Okay, So if we run the Newton's method 20 times, we will get to the central path. But what happens if we run the Newton's method only five times? Okay, So we won't get to the central path, but we'll be close to the central path. right? And then we can reduce the value of epsilon, and we can rerun the Newton's algorithm to get close to the central path, but not exactly at the central path. So there is an inherent dilemma in this particular problem which is to whether to run the Newton's method so as Newton's method completely so as to get as close to central path as possible or to run the Newton's method just so many times so that you are close to the central path in some sense and then change the value of epsilon and restart your restart your uh, iterations again is that is that clear let me let me write it down the exact method and what we are trying to do here. The exact method is I find xk, which is argument of a f of x plus epsilon k b of x, right? Where x is in capital X. This is the exact method, exact barrier method. Now I'm saying that, well, I know that this is the point, I'm not interested in xk, I'm interested in the limit of xk. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to approximate it where xk is close to argument of f of x plus epsilon k bx, x in capital X. Okay, so what does this what does this do? What's the benefit? What's the benefit of this method? Any thoughts, guesses? What's the benefit of so this is the exact barrier or uh, exact barrier uh, method, right? But what I'm saying is, well, I'm not going to do the exact method. I'm going to do the approximate method where xk is close to the argument. 
but not the argument itself. Okay? And as long as I am close to the argument, I will change the value of epsilon k and rerun this entire optimization again. So what's the benefit that I'm getting out of this approximate method? Sorry? It's easy to solve? Lower computational complexity, right? If I want to solve this problem exactly for every value of epsilon k, I have to probably run the gradient descent on Newton's method several times, okay? In this case, I don't have to solve it several times. All I have to do is a couple of times, maybe three times, maybe four times, some number, okay? And I know that I've gotten close to this point. I can change the value of epsilon k, and I can restart the Newton's method or gradient descent or whatever again to get to the new value of xk plus one. And remember, the idea here uh, in the barrier method is this xk converges to, so xk in the limit converges to the optimal point. It turns out that for this particular problem, we can prove that this xk that is close to the argument, if it converges, it converges to the optimal point. Okay, so this approximate method reduces the computational complexity by not running the iteration all the way to get to the argument, runs the iteration a few times only at every point, at every step of the algorithm, and yet in the limit, yet in the limit, it converges to the optimal point. Okay, so the idea here in this particular, in, in this case, <clears throat> is we start with some x naught. Well, this is my, this is not, okay. So I start with some x naught, then I run Newton's method. Now I've gotten close to the central path. Now I'm gonna change the epsilon, and I will reach here. Then I will change the epsilon, and I will reach here. Okay, so I'm not on the central path, even though I'm, the barrier method says that I always have to be on the central path. But what I'm doing is in the first iteration, I'm going to run several Newton steps to get to get closer to the central path. And then instead of going on the path itself, I'm going to go close to the path and I'll converge eventually to the optimal point. Okay? So that's the benefit of using this approximate method instead of the exact method. And so we'll do that method in the next class where we will prove a sequence of results to show to show the following important result. If you are close to the central path, then all you need is one Newton step at every point of time. So one Newton step will get here, one Newton step will get here, one Newton step. That's all we need. And we'll still remain close to the central path. Okay, so that's the result that we will study in detail in the next class. Uh, I think it has nothing to do with the tolerance, but it has more to do with provability. You cannot prove that it will converge eventually to the optimal point, okay? But if you run a few experiments, it's highly likely that you will converge eventually to the optimal point, okay? So the stability issue may not arise. Uh, but the problem is you want to prove that it will always converge to the optimal point, so in which case you need that condition, extra condition, that you have to be close to the central part.